Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and we're going to have a fantastic and incredible episode today, so hopefully you enjoy it. And our topic is going to be the EU elections from yesterday, which the right had a pretty strong showing throughout the continent, and we're going to discuss those results, what they mean, and what is our takeaways from this. So in the big countries, mainly France and Germany, the right did very well. Uh, National rally, that's Le Pen's party, got the most votes in France. And this has forced Macron to call for snap elections in France to, you know, parliamentary elections, not their national parliament, not the EU parliament in response to this, because he's felt that the EU elections don't technically impact domestic politics or they don't. I mean, not. Let me, I don't want to say impact, but they don't um, change the domestic composition of your parliament and anything. But they do. They do signal that you've lost support, or you no longer have the type of popular backing that you need to be in government. Is that this is showing what the country would vote for if there were, if there was a national election for your regular parliaments. And France is where the nationalists had the best result. National Rally was the dominant party. They got nearly twice the number of votes. Actually, they did. Well, it depends on where they're exactly counting. They're still counting. But right now, they got nearly 32%. And Macron's party got under 15%. So they got more than double the amount of votes that Macron did. And that's the second party. Now, the it's a pretty weird election because the Republicans, that's the... Obviously, that's the English translation of the name. That's the center-right party. Generally, they've moved into a more immigration restrictionist direction over the last decade. They're much better than they were under Sarkozy. I think under Sarkozy, they had a different name. This party, which is the traditional Gaullist party, has gone through many different names. I think they've gone through at least three names since I've been alive. But it's the same with National Rally. I mean, they used to be National Front. Now they're National Rally. They changed it in 2017 after the presidential election that year. Any case, they usually are seen as like, sometimes people are like, oh, they're the ones that people should back. They have the actual chance to win. And they got well under 10%. They came in fifth in this election. The other parties, Macron's party, which is centrist, I would say traditionally rooted in the center left, but it's now more centrist. I mean, even on economic policy, it would be considered right wing by American standards. He's wanted to, you know, reform the entitlement system, They're pro free market. They're generally not socialist. Then there's the new socialist faction, which is called Wake Up Europe. They came in third. Then there's Menachon's far left party that's, you could call them the true socialists, came in fourth. All these parties got over 10%, and then there was the Republicans that got like 8%. Um, so not a very good result for them. Now, Zemmour's Reconquest Party, which some people could argue is to the right of National Rally, got over 5% of the vote. So if you combine that with National Rally's total, and then maybe you could throw in the Republicans' total, if you want to just say right-wing immigration restrictionist, you know, it's well over 40 percent, it's almost close to 50 percent of the vote. And so that's a very strong showing from the right. I mean, I'm you know, I've been following politics for a long time. And I remember when I was a kid, even, you know, and when you're a kid, you don't really get much information as you should. And this is not bef- this is well before people were using the Internet like they use it today. In 2002, Jean-Marie Le Pen who is Marine Le Pen's father, went to a runoff with uh, Jacques Chirac in the presidential election. And this was a major news story. They're all like, oh, fascism is on the rise. This is terrible. How could this happen? And Jean-Marie Le Pen didn't even get 20% in the runoff against Jacques Chirac. So uh, Chirac uh, easily won the election. And but they've been I mean, they've had close times that they've come to a runoff. And even in 2017, you know, when there was a runoff, uh, Marine Le Pen got, I think, like 35 uh, percent. She increased her total a little bit. 
2022, but it was still under 40% if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, I am mistaken. She almost got 42%. And in 2017, she got right under 34%. So she did increase her uh, polling support by almost 8%. And that's a that's a big deal because you generally it does show that she could potentially or whoever they're going to have for the person to run. They could have Jordan Bardella, who's currently the um, he's at least the figurehead. He's the nominal leader, but it's generally still seen as Marine Le Pen as he, as him running for office. Now, Bardella is 28. So some may think he's too young and maybe he doesn't have as high name recognition as Marine Le Pen, but. There does seem, you know, Le Pen has uh, not, you know, the daughter has run for president ever since for over 10 years. Her father, the last time he ran was in 2007, and she's run ever since 2012. Uh, so this would be her fourth time running for office. So that may people have already developed their opinions of her. And there's just not enough people who will go to, to push her to the president. Uh, so they may it may be better for them to go with Bardella. Now you, I thought there might be an age requirement that you know it's similar to America. Maybe it has to be thirty, but I mean it's in twenty twenty seven. If you'd be thirty by then, or similar to America, thirty five. But there appears to be not an age requirement for to run for pre French president. So this guy would be thirty one, and when running for president in twenty twenty seven, he could still be president. And he is seen as the big lead, winner of these elections. There's a lot of news articles talking about how, how he's the future of the right. He's the new face of the right. And so he could be the guy that they actually get to run and win for office. And this would be a huge victory for France to have nationalists in charge. Now, some may point to uh, George Maloney's party in Italy, which we'll go to in a moment because that's another important part to talk about the EU elections and say, well, these people might let us down. Well, I would say this. Uh, you have to at least take the uh, chance and opportunity to see what can happen because otherwise it's like, what's the alternative to doing that? You know, some people then it's just like all these elections are pointless. All the politics is pointless. Everyone's going to end up like Maloney. I think the difference is, is France is a much stronger country, a more important country than Italy. Italy is an important country. This is different from, say, Slovakia uh, electing a nationalist. Like having France or Germany with a nationalist leadership is a huge deal because those are the two main countries in Europe. Those are where everyone turns to to see where leadership is. And so those that is a big deal if they go in a nationalist direction. And you need those types of things to happen for there to be change in Europe. And so if they elect a nationalist president and also a French president is the strongest uh, head of state that you can have in Europe, because unlike most of the other countries where the president is just a figurehead in a ceremonial role, I mean, they could technically call for, uh, you know, dismiss uh, their parliament and call for elections, but they don't really do that. I mean, they're just kind of there to meet and greet and be a kind of stand in for royalty. You know, the president has a lot of power and they're able to do a lot more than anyone else in, in Europe. You know, and they're simply not just the head of the party and dependent on their parliamentary um, proportions like in other countries, like in Germany, like in the UK, they can do a lot more than presidents in other countries or any type of chancellor or prime minister. So it's a very big deal if a nationalist gets that role. And it appears the national rally, if these snap elections go as planned, that they're going to get the plurality of seats in the domestic, in the national parliament. And that'd be a huge change because that was a big victory in 2022 because you know, they saw the presidential election and they're like, oh, they're not going to do that well in the parliament. And they generally never do well. And then they got, you know, the second most votes or they got the second most seats in, in the French parliament. Actually, quick correction. They got the third most votes in the election, but they had never done really well. They had under 10 you know, representatives, even though they're competing in the presidential election or they're making it to the runoff in the past two years. They only had like eight 
representatives and the National Assembly. They don't call it the parliament, but whatever, you know, legislative elections. And then they increased it to nearly 90 to becoming the third biggest party. And now in these elections, and they've always struggled in the in the legislative elections because of the nature of, of French elections. It is, it's not quite proportional where in like other countries say, if you get 5% of the vote, well, you get 5% of the seats, uh, you know, no matter what. France did experiment with the 80s and the National Front did so well that they're like, uh, we're not doing this anymore. So they've already struggled with it. It's a little, it's different from America's system. It's not quite, you know, you put up a candidate, whoever wins, they, they have like two rounds. We're not going to get into the, technical, into the technical details, but they've, the way the system runs, it's been hard for them to uh, get the type of representation that they deserve in the National Assembly, which is different from say Germany and Italy, where, you know, if they get 20% of the vote, then they get 20% of the seats. And that's been very good for nationalist parties. And that's also why Britain, UK struggles to develop a nationalist alternative to the conservatives. We'll see how the July 4th elections or the July elections hold there in the UK with reform party, Nigel Farage's uh, political vehicle does against the Tories. But it's generally favored the establishment in those elections due to the nature of the of the race, which is just like whoever's the top vote getter goes to parliament in these individual races. So let's go I, before I go into what could happen with France and developing a national. So I need to go through all the other countries and a lot of the other places. The results are a little disappointing or bad. Now, the one place where they're very good, even though the party didn't meet its polling expectations, was in Austria, where the Freedom Party, which had thought to been destroyed in 2019 over a variety of scandals. There were two scandals then in 2019. They had a connection to the identitarians, and at that time, the whole news media erupted in outrage because allegedly because the Christchurch shooter had donated to identitarians, and the Freedom Party then made a big showing of like, oh, we're cutting off all connection to them. We denounced the identitarians, even though a lot of the identitarians were working with their youth wing. They were getting volunteers from them for their campaigns. They were even recruiting for candidates. They then hard, did a hard cutoff with them. And then there was this bizarre video sting with this woman claiming she was work for Russia and trying to work with uh, Freedom Party members. And then there was these corruption allegations and their party leader had to resign. And, you know, they got kicked out of the governing coalition with Sebastian Kurtz, who later on had his own corruption scandal and had to leave government. And so they looked like they were finished. It looked very bad for them. And they always seemed to have been one of the strongest nationalist parties in Europe. And then they had this uh, massive catastrophe. But they've since recovered. And now they were the top vote getter in Austria's, in Austria's election. Well, they finished it first. Now, they didn't meet polling expectations, but they were only off by like two points. Uh, they showed them having a little bit larger polling. They got nearly 26% of the vote. Some polls were showing them closer to 30%, but they were still the top vote getter. Second, The second party with the most votes was the center-right party in in uh, Austria, the People's Party. So overall, the results are very good. And the People's Party there has, in the past, <laughs> before you know Kurtz kicked him out, was willing to form a governing coalition with the Freedom Party. And if they did have to have a new government, you know, depending what happens in their parliamentary elections, if they are the top vote getters, they get over 50%, they would form a coalition government. The difference is this time, unlike having Kurtz, who came from the center-right party, it'd be somebody from the Freedom Party, and the Freedom Party would be controlled. And if there are more nationalist governments throughout Europe than there were back in the late 2010s when they formed that governing coalition, then they'll be able to get more done. So Austria is a white pill. And that is probably the biggest success besides France. And I don't think, even though they didn't meet slight didn't quite meet polling expectations i think the bigger picture of them coming back from the debacle of 2019 and emerging as the strongest party in austria and then the second biggest party is also a party that shares a lot of their immigration restrictionist views they're just not as staunch on this 
I think that's a major white pill. So France and Austria are unquestionable white pills. Now, Germany is a little bit different. Still, still good news, but not quite as good news as we expected. The AFD, alter, Alternative for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, we're going to call them the AFD, they got second mo- They got second place behind the CDU, the center-right party, the Christian Democrats, and they gained a bunch of seats. So their results greatly improved. But they didn't get quite as... The polling was much less... Um, or they earned vote... The amount of votes that they earned was substantially less than what they had been polling at you know, earlier this year. Earlier this year and late last year, they were a lot of times hovering around 20% and sometimes exceeding 20% in Germany. And that's a big deal because unlike all the other countries, Germany is still the most hostile towards nationalism due to the World War II guilt and having a really strong intelligence state that is fully committed to destroying nationalists. And due to the fact that they now have a nationalist party that's competing, which they really haven't had uh, since the end of World War II. I mean, the last time they had a party that was competing was a direct descendant of the Nazi party, the Socialist Reich Party, that was getting uh, over 12% of the vote in the early 50s, and then they banned it. And ever since then, there's never been a nationalist party to cross the 10% threshold. There really hasn't been a party to cross the 5% threshold. There's occasionally been some of these nationalist parties to get into the uh, EU uh, parliament but they've never really been much of a threat. And the AFD is now getting, in the EU elections, they got nearly 16%. Now, this is both a disappointment and still an accomplishment because before this election, they were having scandal after scandal and the news media was portraying them as neo-Nazis and as the greatest threat to Germany that has ever existed. There was the meeting with Martin Sellner, leader of the Identitarians, where they had talked about re-migration, which led to a huge outrage in Germany, and there were millions of people protesting, and there were renewed calls to ban the party, and uh, you know the interior minister is threatening to arrest people involved in the meeting, and anyone donating to AFD and going after AFD donors and supporters. Then there was one of their leaders who uh, defended the a Waffen SS like a month ago, which, and by defending, he, it, let me, I want to rephrase this, is that he defended men who fought in the Waffen SS and saying that they weren't acute, they weren't criminals, that they were veterans, were noble veterans, whatever. It was something like, it was not defending the organization, just the pe- some of the people who fought within it. But those comments also created an outrage and that ha- and that led to other parties and their parliamentary bloc in EU, Identity and Democracy, which includes National Rally and Lega from Italy, to kick AFD out of that parliamentary bloc, which was another setback for them and led to disputes and, and feuding within these European nationalist parties. So they've had a lot. They've had and they've had intelligence agencies continue and leaders claim that they're a terrorist group and a threat to the constitutional order they've had attacks on their candidates they've just had a lot of stuff going on and yet they were still emerged with 16 percent of the vote so that's still an accomplishment and the cdu is trying to take a lot of their rhetoric about immigration cdu is moving beyond its days when with angela merkel as a leader where they're embracing open borders and immigration and they're trying to state and immigration restrictionist stance. And even the left-wing coalition is trying to get on the immigration restrictionist bandwagon, despite championing increased immigration and looser immigration laws for their their whole time being in power, which they took power in late 2021. They're now trying to say, oh, we want uh, want to deport uh, people who violate our laws. They're trying to, you know, say that they're going to have stricter enforcement because there's been so much crime and high profile stabbings coming from immigrants that they haven't to change their views. And the German public is overwhelmingly turning against immigration. So Germany itself is a interesting case. You aren't quite getting the nationalist, widespread national support that you like 
for there. And also the CDU is never going to have a coalition with AFD, or at least not this decade. We'll see next decade. It takes a long time for them to agree to a coalition with these things. I mean, it, it does. There's always been these cases where it, it's a constant work to where you can finally get the ruling party to agree to a, go a governing coalition. It's similar to like Netherlands. Like they always said that they're never going to uh, join a party. They're never going to have a coalition with Geert Wilders party. But then when he wins, gets the most votes, then they get a coalition party. There was a long time where the the conservative party, center right party in Austria said, we're not going to have a coalition with the Freedom Party. Eventually they did. Sweden, it's been similar. So it takes a long time, but I think it's a lot of Germany's national identity is so tied up with a World War II guilt and, you know, fear of any type of nationalist party. That's going to take a look much long time or much longer time to chip away at that resistance. So still good news. Um, if you really care about immigration and what people think, I think it is still largely good news because people now consider the CDU as as immigration restrictionists. And also the left wing coalition was destroyed. They were there was the Social Democrats and the Green Party finished third and fourth, respectively, behind AFD and their humiliation and the fact that voters are rejecting them largely due to their immigration policy and their energy policy. It has, um, it is, does send a strong signal. So those are the, and those, so those are the three big results. Now, we'll go through the smaller countries. I'm not gonna spend much time on them. Not as very good results in a lot of these places. In Belgium, the Vlaams Belong, which is a nationalist party there, or the Flemish separatist party, the strongest right-wing party there. They were supposed to be the top vote earner and they did not achieve that. Instead, a different Flemish center-right party that doesn't quite call for separation, but greater autonomy for Flanders, was the top vote getter. Um, Vlaams Belong still increased their vote total from previous elections and are now have more representatives in the EU Parliament, but they were supposed to become the top party. They did not meet polling expectations. So that's a bit of a disappointment. Still progress, but not quite the progress you want. Uh, Netherlands, uh, the right-wing parties there did, apparently didn't really compete, according to people's uh, sources over there, and people are telling you this. I mean, Geert Wilders' party is one of the uh, least um, exciting parties, or the parties that would draw probably the least amount of enthusiasm from nationalists. I mean, still they care about immigration and the stuff that we care about, but they do or, or they are a little bit more neocon than other parties, uh, European nationalist parties. But they uh, they didn't really compete in the election, so their results weren't as strong as they were in, in parliamentary elections. Uh, Denmark, the nationalists didn't did poorly. Same with Finland. In Sweden, the Swedish Democrats increased their vote total, yet they were far behind other parties. They were not. They were. They got fourth amount, the most amount of votes, and also the socialists were the top vote getters in that parliamentary election. So that's a that's definitely the entire trend of it goes against all their trends in Europe because generally if the nationalists weren't doing good in a country, then the center right was performing strongly. And the center right parliamentary bloc within the EU did very well and has you know increased their um, their proportional representation and are expected to can still control the EU. They're generally not very good on an EU level as they're you know fully behind the Ukraine war. They're not taking as strong a stance on immigration that they should. Still better what the center left would want to be doing on immigration, but they're not very, uh, still not very strong. There's a lot of room to criticize them on how they're handling a lot of the big issues. So, but that's in Sweden, it just booked the whole trend is that the left did the best in the parliamentary elections. Uh, SD, you know, Swedish Democrats still did okay, but uh, the results are rather disappointing. In Poland, uh, the it, it's a little bit different. I guess the center left party was the top vote earner. Law and Justice Party, which governed the country for most of the 2010s, uh, is not doing well. Confederacy, which is the nationalist party, there uh, was a third top vote getter. So that's a that's a that's good news because Confederacy has usually done or Confederation, however you want to translate it has generally not 
has struggled to get a lot of votes, but now the fact that they're the third strongest vote getter, I think that signals uh, something's happening in Poland. A law and justice party has a lot of problems, but confederacy or confederation is much better than law and justice. So now that brings us to Italy, which is one of the weirder uh, election stories, because if you've been following Twitter and you've seen like how the right worldwide has reacted to Maloney, they've all seen her as a traitor and as the worst, you know, how could anyone support her? She's the worst leader they've ever had, the biggest traitor that you could ever imagine because she went in there promising to do something about immigration. She hasn't really done anything on about immigration, but she has pushed Italy greater within American hegemony and what the what and what American empire wants. And she's been the most fervent supporter of the Ukraine war more so than any other European leader. And despite Biden saying that she's anti-democratic when she was elected, and this is a threat to her democracy by her winning, she then sucked up to Biden and now they're pro Maloney. So you're seeing all this from a foreign perspective and you're like, wow, Italians must be turning on her. Instead, Brothers of Italy, her party, increased their vote total. They are the by far the dominant party in Italy right now. And you're like, that's that's wild. And all of her and her right wing coalition partners, there's a center right party that was Berlusconi's party, uh, Forza Italia. And then there's Lega. Lega is generally the party that I think most nationalists would prefer. Salvini's much better than Maloney. But they all took a drubbing, especially Lega. Lega lost a significant number of seats in this in this election. They went from having over 20% of, you know, the vote to having less than 9% of the vote. You know, they used to be the strongest party within uh, the EU parliament for Italy. Now they're, you know, like fifth. So huge embarrassment for Lega in that. And so that strengthens Maloney is that she now sees her party as the strongest in the coalition by far. Her two governing uh, coalition partners are below 10%. She can, you know, they're embarrassed, they're humiliated. Now she is the right leader of the Italian right. Her power is solidified. And you have to wonder is like, how did this happen? How is Maloney the so popular among Italians? How, why are they supporting her despite all of her, you know, her poor leadership or how we perceive poor leadership? So I've been I've been trying to look this up and saying because it's like something that is not given to a domestic audience. But a lot of this is by force of personality. She's very charismatic leader. She does signal that she's the leader of Italy, which throughout the late 2010s with a five star movement was leading it. And then the previous government was leading it. And there was a lot of chaos within the domestic government. And there wasn't there was horrible leadership. No one had much confidence in their leaders. Maloney gets up there and despite her failures to do anything about immigration, somehow is able to exude confidence and say that she's the leader. And that's why voters are normal, normie Italians are gravitating towards her because it's like, oh, finally we have a prime minister who's in charge, who is not, you know, dissolving her government, who is not, uh, you know, who's actually trying to work with people, which there's been these center left, uh, you know, governors who have praised her for, oh, well, we had disaster and Maloney came out and worked with us and did a great job. And so it's more of the technical aspects of governing, which isn't quite what nationalists are worked up about, that is making her popular. She's also been doing a, a good job in terms of in Italian opinions of getting EU money for her country and also her hard stance on Ukraine and support for Ukraine is still popular in Europe. This is the thing about the elections is that Europe is still not turning against Ukraine, is that being seen as pro-Russia is still a detriment to you in these European countries. I mean, this is a case with Lega. Apparently one of Lega's problems, well, Lega's problems is that they, even though Salvini has criticized Maloney's actions on immigration, they're still part of the governing coalition. So a lot of those right-wing voters who maybe feel that they're betraying or that that governing coalition isn't doing enough still will blame Lega. Second is they, they're, most Italians are still very pro-Ukraine and they 
see Lega's too pro Russia. So that's hurt them. Apparently, also, Salvini was calling for bringing back conscription, which is very unpopular in all these countries. They're all talking about bringing back conscription, um, which is not a popular proposal. And so they went against uh, Lega for that. So that's and that's something across the board that has generally been a factor in all these elections. I think, you know, the only parties that are have the appearance of being anywhere near pro-Russia or the Freedom Party in Austria and National Rally. But France is a little bit different. I mean, even, even Macron is less hostile towards Russia than a lot of other European leaders. And it's it's a more complicated picture there. But uh, that's generally, that generally hurt a lot of these other parties elsewhere in Europe. And I think that was also a factor in Maloney's big victory. And also, I think if you still care about immigration and wanting to solve it, you a lot of these voters still see Maloney as their best bet to do anything about it. They're, they feel that there is no all, other alternative. So they're really worried about this issue. And Maloney still promises that she's going to do stuff within the EU and domestically to try to do something about immigration. And she's tried to implement some measures against illegal immigration. Of course, she's trying to bring in more legal guest workers in, but they do feel that she takes, she and she does actually take a stronger line on immigration than any of the left-wing parties. So the left can't accuse her of being uh, soft on this issue, which is was a factor that helped the center left in Poland in their recent elections last year where the center left party ran by um, uh, you know a huge globalist who was working with the EU was like uh, the was attacking the law and justice party from the right on immigration, saying that they're weak on the issue and that they're trying to bring in more guest workers. So uh, none of the center left party tries to do that against Maloney. So that's like if you care about immigration, they see Maloney as the only option that there is, um, which is not a very good result. So in, I think you could say it's a mixed bag, but I think the results from France and the fact that the, the most of these nationalist parties outside of these smaller countries is like, at the end of the day, Sweden, Denmark, um, the Belgium and Finland aren't that important. What is most important is Germany, France, Italy, and to, and to a lesser extent, Austria. And there, there's still a strong support for nationalism, even though the nationalists they're supporting in Italy is not somebody we want, would want them to support. But if the center left parties had done better, had been the biggest vote getters in Italy, that would have wouldn't have just been been a repudiation of Maloney. That would have been a repudiation of nationalism and immigration restriction. So, and despite her failures to uphold those principles, that's still what she represents in Italy. So in those major countries, the nationalists are doing very well. Uh, Italy, more complicated picture, but they're still advancing. They're still progressing. And in France, they're now the strongest political force there is. And if they, if the nationality gets, you know, becomes the dominant party within the National Assembly, that is an even bigger victory. And that signals that the nationality can win the presidency in 2027 and that's the type of major shakeup, major change you need to see something interesting happen in europe in the next um, you know the next decade anything to happen and i think it's very likely that a nationalist could win in france in 2027 and that would be just as big as trump winning a second term and that could change the whole course of world history i, I don't want i want to i don't want to I am going to be that overblown and, and, and state the prospects for that. Because this, it, it, it would be within 25 years, because the last election wasn't, you know, 20, you know, compared to what happened in 2002, where they didn't even get 20%, and the whole country comes out against the fascism of Jean-Marie Le Pen. And then in 25 years, they go from that status, prior status, to pre the presidency, that is a major transformation. And then if they have, you know, stronger coalition partner, if they have a nationalist government in Austria, maybe they can force whoever, you know, Maloney to be, you know, stick up to her, to her stated principles in Italy. And maybe if there's a more right-leaning government, 
in Germany. Maybe they can force them to bring in AFD into that coalition. That's probably not going to happen, but one can dream. Then you could have this whole power block within Central Europe that can direct the EU to be much better and to uh, advance in the identitarian direction that we'd like. So I think that's all very possible and it's very much of a white pill that we can see. And you could even see maybe that this is the start of emergence of a truly independent European bloc that's truly right wing, not, you know, the type of libtardism that it would be a European bloc now. And it's working to separate itself from the American empire. And, you know, it works to repair the relations with Russia and other things. I still am skeptical of what that would be, what would be, whether that's possible or whether even in relations with Russia would make them more keyed because Russia is, is trying to weaponize immigration against Europe in order to punish them for their actions over Ukraine, uh, which I, I can't support. But there are a lot of possibilities there. And I think that this is, uh, there. It offers new opportunities to, for thinking the world and where we can project, you know, our political strategies and where where we where we can see hope arising and maybe there can be somewhere to support. And so if you have a strong, powerful European bloc that's right wing and is trying to be more independent of the American empire and is restricting immigration and is standing up for its heritage, I think that that could be a very white pilling experience and that could all happen by the end of the decade, as signals by these EU parliamentary elections. So my main uh, takeaway from this is that it's a major white pill, even though some of the results weren't as strong as they, we should have expected. Uh, I think it would have been, if AFD had gotten nearly 20%, I think it would just be a massive, massive victory. Still a very strong victory. But even the AFD getting 16% is still remarkable considering all the problems that they've had and all the struggles and opposition that they faced within Europe or within their own country. So those that is my takeaway from the EU results. So I always try to give people hope and give them some white pills where there are. And I think this is one of those uh, examples. And I think that this also signals strongly for what's going to happen for us in November is that, and similar to how Brexit signaled that there's an, you know, an international nationalist uprising, and that this signal that Trump could win, the fact of how strong the EU elections are signals that Trump can win. And I think if, once Trump's in power, it'd be much easier for these nationalist governments to take root and face less opposition from America, you know, because we're not gonna have like the Biden administration, people like complaining about their nationalist parties or the right wing parties and them not accepting enough immigrants like Biden does. I think you'd see a change in how we interact with Europe and allowing for these uh, nationalist uh, governments to emerge and to govern uh, in the most effective way possible without American interference. So all that, it's all about, um, you know, the whole West is an up, up in arms over immigration and starting to realize these identitarian issues. And many, many people are taking out that frustration and that opposition to what they're seeing around them and to the great replacement at the polls. And so I think that this is all very good news and is something to be optimistic about. So that is my takeaway from the EU parliamentary elections. Now we're gonna get into the Cotton League questions. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me Questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Codvalet option at highly respected Substack. That's at highly-respected.com and make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements while you're there. First, we'll start off with K-Max. We always like to start off with K-Max. K-Max is questions. He's got two questions in one question. So he's got three questions. He said, what is the main driver of wokeness and open borders in your view, the corporations or the government? Um, so he's asking whether, you know, on the immigration issue of what drives immigration support and what drives wokeness are two different things. Because he says what's causing that corporation and governments. And he says, however many I felt corporations pay off GOP congressmen to push for amnesty and border control when most of the base does not want it. 
And many feel that the government bureaucracy that continues this ridiculous wokeness and pressure corporations. Do they work hand in hand or do you, who do you blame more? What causes the media and Hollywood to be so woke? Uh, again, I ask where this does this woke pressure come from? Uh, so there's two different questions on immigration that we'll start with that. What's the most pressure comes from corporations, government? I would say rather than corporations, I would say economic interests. Those are the people like, oh, we need these workers. They work so hard. They're better than native, you know, truly native Americans. We need to get them over here. And so it's really just pushing. It's economic interests that are pushing this because they're like, we need workers. And the government is just like, OK, they the government merely facilitates it. But right now, what's drawing these immigrants is so much corporations are the government. It's literally just social media thinking that they can come over here and make, you know, have a gigantic house and have this achieve the American dream. And that's why the entire fucking world's coming here. And they're, they're facilitated by social media to coming here. And so the border crisis is because there's not enough. These people can't even work these jobs. So, and the economic interest wishes that it was done in a more orderly fashion where they have work uh, visas of some sort or work permits so they can take these jobs. And instead, a lot of these people are just coming to live on welfare. And the government's not doing anything about it. So the government is more responsible for the border crisis simply because they're not enforcing the law and they're letting all these people in and they're believing their uh, ridiculous asylum stories. So they get in and they get um, the type of uh, support they're getting. But I would say, but historically, I would say it's mostly economic interests. The economic interests are always the ones who are pushing for the more workers and cheaper labor force. And so I would, it's not quite, you know, uh, for most illegal immigrants, if they don't feel that they're going to get a job, uh, they're probably not going to come here. So if economic interests were trying to draw them in. Uh, many of them wouldn't come here. Some of them, but now they're still coming here no matter what, because they think this is the land of opportunity or whatever. Uh, why is media and Hollywood so woke? I mean, it's not, that's just generally the people are going to gravitate towards this. That's the elite ideology. Uh, if you're, you know, if you look at the uh, party makeup or what people are, the parties that people at uh, elite universities vote for, it's over 90% voting of them are voting for Democrats. So liberalism is the default elite ideology. And many of these people, especially with Hollywood, you know, the creative types, creative types are generally going to lean liberal. And so there, it's not so much of an outside pressure. It's just what they genuinely believe. And they show that inherent bias in how they treat the news and how they make movies and how they do TV shows. That bias of the writers, directors, actors, and journalists, editors, and TV pundits, you know, all that just is comes from their group consensus and what they genuinely believe. I don't think that that's uh, a pressure coming from corporations or the government. Um, if they looked at you know economic interests, they would see how well Fox News does. So they would be want to be less uh, biased and less liberal, but yet they're still very biased and liberal. I some you could say that it's um, audience driven a bit for media. I think for the big publications because New York Times and Washington Post became really left wing and hysteric in the Trump administration because that's what their audience wanted. Their audience wanted to pretend we're living under fascist dictatorship and democracy is about to end tomorrow. You know, it's when Washington Post adopted the melodramatic uh, tagline of democracy dies in darkness. You know, that's what their audience wanted to hear. So it's driven by market incentives in some ways. But even with Hollywood, you know, their woke movies are bombing, yet they still implement it. But that's just reflecting the inherent biases of the people involved in producing and creating this stuff. So I would say that that's my answer to that. And then his uh, second question, or her third question, maybe. Uh, Scott, you mentioned a while back in a debate with Ramsey Paul how as long as Tucker Carlson is on Fox News, anyone with our views in college could go to a college Republicans meeting, meeting and bring up Tucker Carlson. And if they are fans of Tucker, they are 95% or more in line with dissident right views. Now that Tucker is off Fox News, has this influence wane? 
what now could any Scott young Scott Greer fan do at a college Republican meeting? Could they still bring up Tucker or better to bring up other figures now? No, they could still bring up Tucker. I think actually uh, when that debate happened in 2021 or early 2022, I forget when the when the date happened. So it was over two years ago. Uh, the amount of young college Republicans or people at FedSoc who are into these ideas is even greater from uh, what I'm hearing. So there's a ton of figures you could bring up. You could bring up me. Uh, if you wanted to bring up a mainstream figure, you don't want to go full on like uh, dissonant views, but just signal that you're into this stuff. You could still bring up Tucker. You could bring up Trump himself. I think that even if you look at what mainstream conservatives are talking about that young people listen to, because young, most of the young crowd is not tuning into Fox News. They're watching, they're watching, uh, you know, streams and podcasts and stuff. And generally, even what the mainstream stuff like Daily Wire and The Blaze are talking about is more in line with our views than they would have been even in 2021. <clears throat> I mean, even if you look at like what Matt Walsh and Charlie Kirk talk about, it, a lot of times it sounds like an alt-right podcast from 2016. And that is filtering down to the younger crowd because the younger crowd is not getting their information from the traditional conservative media like Fox News, Wall Street Journal, that type of stuff. They're on talk radio. They're getting their information from the online media sphere. And so even if they're turning to more mainstreamish or even cucky sources, those mainstream mainstreamish cucky sources are echoing dissonant right viewpoints much more so than they would have been at any point in time, you know, even in 2021, and especially in the Trump years. You know, they're all talking about immigration restriction. They'll all talk about how the great replacement is real. They'll all talk about how anti-white racism is the real form of racism in our country. And that's um, something that we have to deal with. And so they generally, they even, you know, will criticize Israel, which nobody would have done a few years ago. So that's generally what the mainstream media market is like. So I always worried about what would happen if Tucker is taken off the air and maybe there'd be a waning of influence of mainstream distant right viewpoints, but it's actually the opposite's happened. It's only gotten stronger in that year that Tucker's been off. I think it's already now baked in. Um, uh, baked in keenness, you could say, like a, an opposition of baked in wokeness. Uh, I think it's, and you can even see this in lawmakers, what all lawmakers are talking about. Uh, I think uh, fewer lawmakers themselves are willing to talk about the Great Replacement if they're not seeing it on Tucker, but their staffers are more willing to talk about it now than they would have been in 2021 or 2022. Uh, and from what I'm hearing about the college Republican chapters and these you know, young Republican groups, they're far more right wing than they've ever been. Uh, and you could find like minded people at these events than you would have. And it would be much it would have been much harder to find like minded people. Uh, certainly when I was in college, you wouldn't have found like minded people at all. Uh, but even in when Trump was president, it's far more likely to find like minded people. Because a lot of those college Republicans back then were like, I hate Trump. He's not a conservative. He's not for limited government. Well, I think today, if you went in and said that to pretty much most uh, college Republican chapters, they laugh you out of the meeting. So I think that that's a positive development there. So we have uh, that. Uh, we got another Trump question, this time from Dollar Bill. He said, what do you think of the claim that Trump is essentially an 80s centrist Democrat whose views never changed over time? I don't believe that. <laughs> I, I don't believe that at all. No, I don't think that's quite the case. Trump's even views weren't even really a centrist Democrat. As Trump always was intrinsically, or instinctually, not rather, instinctually racially minded. And that's something that is 80 centrist Democrats wouldn't understood because, you know, the nature of dealing with the real estate market in New York and politics in New York is that he really understood these racial dynamics that a lot of normies, even back in the 80s, wouldn't have quite fully understood. And he also felt that this, that the world is not, you know, this little happy place where we can all just trade with one another and 
we can achieve world peace. He always felt that on the global stage, it's a brutal competition between powers. And he was always highly motivated by the fact that the Japanese, which at the time the Japanese were seen as our great, great economic rival rather than China, they're eating our lunch and they're making us weak. And if they gain strength, then they gain strength at our expense. And that's something that centrist Democrats wouldn't have quite believed. And his also views on crime, which Democrats eventually became harder on crime in the early night. Well, really just Bill Clinton, because they realized how bad they were getting killed on this issue by Republicans. So they adopted that issue. While Trump was already like a tough on crime guy in the 80s, you know, he wanted the death penalty brought back for the Central Park Five uh, in 89. You know, he always had those views. And just a year before, Dukakis ran for president on a soft on crime message. And, you know, he refused to change his policies that are allowing murderers like Willie Horton to go and brutalize innocent civilians. So uh, I don't think his views even in the 80s were in line, but he's never been a social conservative. I mean, he's always been libertine. You know, he's always uh, had a lot of uh, sex outside of marriage. You know, he's always been, you know, bragging about his sex life. You know, he's not a devout Christian. Uh, he's very unique, but I even think that wouldn't have even been, a, you know, the case for centrist Democrats. Where he's most defers from Republicans or conservatives are on issues that Democrats wouldn't have been. You know, it's not like Democrats in the 80s were like, oh, yeah, I'm having sex with tons of hot models. You know, a Gary Hart in the 88 race had a suggestive photo with a young woman who wasn't his wife you know she was this one was sitting on his on his lap and they all these reporters spent they sent dozens of reporters to find out proof that he had committed adultery against his wife against his wife and they finally found proof of a woman who claimed that they had an affair and it destroyed his presidential campaign now affairs don't even hurt candidates i mean it's they still hurt male candidates more than female candidates they don't harm female candidates at all I mean, look at what the reaction to what happened with Nikki Haley's allegations of adultery. She was the victim. They treated her as the victim. It's like, how dare you attack a woman for, you know, her personal life? Um, men, it's still, it's still a problem, but it won't destroy them. I mean, you know, look at the amount of support that was rallied behind Trump for, pay, for offering hush money to a playmate uh, or a porn star for uh, having an extramarital affair, uh, you know. So I, I think he, he's never been really a social conservative on issues like abortion and stuff, but he claims to be, you know, he's certainly more pro-life than any Democrat there is. Uh, so I wouldn't say he's essentially an 80th centrist Democrat. You know, even the 80th centrist Democrats were very pro-free trade and were big into, you know, global global economic co-prosperity and stuff uh you know they were the ones pushing for nafta well you know trump's always been a critic of that and even their racial views of just like we don't see race you know trump has always seen race he's always been instinctually keyed and 80 centrist democrats were not uh you could say some democrats of the 60s and 70s were uh instinctually keyed but not by the 80s so i wouldn't really believe that i think uh He's had core views that have stuck with him uh, all the time. The only things he's changed on are stuff like abortion, uh, maybe single payer or how to pay for health care. It's kind of like the traditional Republican conservative ideas that he has to you know, abide by to be their leader. But on the core issues on trade, immigration, how you see race, and even just like on the nature of the world and how everything is a brutal competition, you know, between individuals and peoples he's uh he's always been there and that was very different from centrist democrats so we got that um we will go to we have two music questions so i'll save one for the uh mailbag so we'll go with walter today and uh, the other music question will be for the mailbag walter asks I'm curious to hear what your experience with live classical music has been. What has been the best places you've heard perform pieces you've performed live? Obviously, there's a lot of wokeness associated with that milieu in America, but after attending a recent 
orchestra performance that hit me that there were no LGBT imagery or propaganda at all, despite the occurring in a deep blue city during Pride Month. In fact, I realize I've never encountered any forced left propaganda while enjoying laugh live classical music. Just an observation, but I can't say the same about many of the spring, uh, the sporting events I've been to. Uh, the best one was an outdoor performance of selections from the ring, Wagner's ring. Uh, it was just incredible. It was an incredible setting. Um, they really hit all the, the best moments of it. Uh, they did. It wasn't quite the Wagner without words, which I, or the ring without words, which I've also seen. Uh, they had some of the they had some of the singing parts with it, some of the famous ones from it. I would say that that's the best one. Um, other uh, one of the better experiences I really like seeing is that uh, the Metropolitan Opera does these live in the Met performances that are streamed across the movie theaters across the country, and there's. Uh, I wouldn't say that they're quite better, but I do enjoy the experience. I would say that they're equal because there's differences that happen with going to say, seeing an opera at <coughs> live, like in person. Because depending on where you're going to go see the opera, uh, if they have a screen in the corner, which is showing the subtitle or the dialogue in English, then it makes it better. But a lot of places don't do that because they don't, they don't have the space and you know that's uh they feel that's going to interrupt the per performance so like even at the met they have you know just these screens in front of your in front of your seat that have the dialogue but it becomes distracting because you have to keep going back from the stage to the dialogue to see what they're saying and you're not sure what to what to uh focus on and it breaks your concentration live in the met it's right at the bottom of the screen no breaking concentration at all and also it's at a movie theater so you can have you know if they serve beverages, you know, alcoholic beverages, you can have that. You don't have to worry about, you know, adjusting your seat and making too much noise. You can even have some popcorn and it makes it a very enjoyable experience. And I saw, um, I've seen two. I saw Valkyrie, Die Valkyrie, um, a second part of Wagner's ring cycle. And that, actually it's all been Wagner. So I'm sorry to say it's all Wagner, but Wagner's operas are awesome. And they must see when they do. Uh, so live in the Met, uh, Wagner's Valkyra, and then the uh, second was Lohengrin, which I also saw live in the Met. I've seen other operas in person, but I thought those are very good experiences uh, seeing it. And it's also they have the cinematic camera angle, so it's it's with that, which is just not seeing it straight stage, and they really do make it a good performance to view on on the big screen. So I would say that those are the best, but on the point of like not seeing wokeness, I mean, you may have some diversity put in there. Uh, I see that they don't really do this with Wagner. They do try to do this more with Mozart, uh, Puccini and Verdi, the all their big performance. But for whatever reason with Wagner, that's always generally all white. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they stay. This. I, I've also noticed that's with Strauss, too. When I look at the performers for Strauss, who would be the other big uh, German language opera composer that you would see in, a, in in America, Richard Strauss, generally all white performers. But if there's like the big stuff that I've, is gonna draw people in, they always try to impose uh, diversity. I mean, there was one uh, opera I was considering going to of uh, La Bohème, uh, Puccini, and the entire cast was Don White. <laughs> <laughs> the entire cast there was no the only white person that was listed in the bill was the female conductor which is another uh issue our good friend uh carl Boehm respecter would have issues with that um so but otherwise besides that you don't really get the full on wokeness sometimes you do there was a the met had a performance of the carmen this year which made Carmen an illegal immigrant who is seducing a border patrol guard. <laughs> and I had a friend who went and saw it and he left in the, uh, after the first act because he's like, I'm not taking this shit anymore. So they do try to do that, but you just have to be prepared for what you're seeing. And generally there are reviews of it. You can see what the production is uh, before you attend. But I think it is less woke. It's also uh, more intellectually gratifying than some sports events. And... They're not going to, you know, even if they're having a pride night, it's not going to be uh, on stage. 
it's hard to have a pro LGBT message in, in a Beethoven symphony. So I think it's always a good public event to go to. I really enjoyed it going to classical performances. Um, as I get older, I don't really like to go to uh, rock metal concerts. I feel like old and out of place at them. Uh, classical uh, performances are more my speed at this moment. And his second question is, you often encourage your viewership to law max as our site is in desperate need of good attorneys. What areas of law would you encourage legally inclined listeners to explore? Criminal law would seem to present many opportunities to people in our movement. Many prosecutor, prosecutorial positions across the country are elected. It's easy to imagine how much of a good, how much good a racially conscious and politically savvy attorney could ju do just by running for DA or county attorney post. This could especially do do a lot to clean up some of the small but diverse towns of the South. Uh, I think it's just when you're exploring this is that you could go into public service. That's all that I say. And you could go into public service no matter what law you're into because there's a lot of guys who focus on corporate law and then they go straight into, you know, the DOJ working on stuff that's not really corporate law, you know, maybe more criminal law um, expertise. I'd really say is just figure out ways that you can utilize your law for public service and uh, public law. Um, because a lot of the positions like, you know, working in nonprofits and stuff is not going to make as much money as working in a normal law firm. But just having those options open to where you could run for a DA post or uh, working, a, working in a, you know, even working in the district attorney's office. You know, all those things could help in, in, in that regard. Uh, I would recommend people to try to figure out paths to go into legal academia. I think one thing we're going that I think the right is going to adopt or they should adopt is that they there's a bunch of great law schools in deep red states where they could utilize that power to bring in conservative lawyers to teach at these schools. And also for unlike for you know, other academic professions, you just need a law degree to teach law school. And they could bring in, you know, and there's a tons and tons of conservative clerks or people who had clerked for judicial, uh, for judges, for federal judges, which is generally where they recruit the legal uh, uh, academia from that could perform in these roles. And maybe they have a normal law job, but they've been connected with conservative circles and they're like, we would like you to teach law at the University of Tennessee or the University of Alabama or University of Georgia and our University of Texas. And then they could develop these major law schools at these red states into serious conservative right wing institutions where then they develop more conservative lawyers and they develop a true counter elite to challenge the libtard regime. So that's something else to look into. So that is, we are on our final question. Everything else will be for the mailbag. And it is from New England Refugee. What are your thoughts on cancellation insurance? If a bunch of right-wingers came together and pay a little a month, they could should be able to help get those who are crushed by the regime get back on their feet. What do you think? Um, uh, well, it depends. If you're in a group that really has to worry about people getting exposed for being in that group and you know help getting on their feet, um, maybe it's an idea if you're really about that, but I think it, you're never going to get people to buy into that. First off, right-wingers are so paranoid and they don't like giving their money to something that they're not going to use it for. Uh, and also they're like, that's my personal information. Um, really that sounds like unemployment, uh, you know, unemployment, uh, which really it would be better if we focused on ensuring that being fired for your political views is would still make you eligible for unemployment. And that could be your cancellation insurance to help you get on your feet. I do think that there is a big difference between now and the early 20 and the late 2010s. People would definitely have been talking about this stuff in the 2010s because this is back when guys were getting debanked all the time. And this is back when white nationalists were wanting to do their own uh, credit union, which they didn't have any capital at all. And the only people who had signed up for it are people with no money. Uh, so I don't, it was not going to work at all. Similar to cancellation insurance. This would have been an idea people would have been really into, but not actually putting money into towards. But I think now, depending on your level of right-wing involvement, you have less to worry about getting canceled 
or less worrying about losing your job. I mean, it's all depends. One is Antifa is not as active as they were in the Trump years. And the Trump years, I remember these guys who got a, a dox from Identity Europa, you know, Antifa was calling all their employers nonstop. They were calling their families nonstop. They were, you know, plastering their face all over their neighborhood. They were really putting in the extra mile to f fuck over these guys. And most of these guys were just like dudes in a group. Today, that doesn't really happen, at least to the best of my knowledge. It's not happening to the same extent that it was happening in the late 2010s. And so, and also Antifa journalists are less inclined to just like dox a random person who's like, he's an accountant in Indiana and he's said some racist stuff on Twitter. They're less inclined to really publicize those people. I know there's been a few doxes lately where it's been, you know, some of the remaining Antifa networks, you know, find somebody, but it really doesn't seem to have the real world impact like it did in like say 2019. Cause I remember the IE stuff, you had major outlets like HuffPost and Daily Beast displaying all these doxes of just some guy who was in a group. And it's like, how is this news worthy? And today they're just not as eager into it. I mean, they can't even cancel Richard Hanania. You know, he still had his book come out despite him being exposed as a eugenicist and other things. So they're less capable of, of canceling people than they were before, um, which is just something that happens. So I don't, I don't think, um, I mean, if you have a close knit group of friends and you all fear that something you're doing uh, may result in employment loss. Maybe it's a good idea, but I don't know how much money would be in there. I think it's better to uh, have a lawsuit over, say, someone denying a person, a, a docs person, their claim for unemployment, and then suing over it, and then establishing a precedent that being fired over your political views does not mean it's you were fired over just cause, and you still would be eligible for unemployment. I think that would be a better solution. Uh, but if you want to do that among your friends, that's fine. I, I just don't think you're going to have much much in the bank for it. And uh, for a larger per picture, I think it's better just to establish that precedent for unemployment. So that is it for Highly Respected today. We are going to have a lot of great content this week. So you be on the lookout for that. So until next time, stay respected.